Like I think we've looked at enough young cases to know it's starting very young, right? 17 is the earliest we've seen the pathology. We now have, we'll have a new paper with dozens of cases of young people, right? So we know it's happening within five to 10 years of your exposure. And it's probably not starting after that. And the question though is, again, so that what that is gonna do is gonna cause a lot of awareness and, and good, um, I think, outcomes for creating uh, better rules for safety and everything like that. So that's the good side. The, the tougher side is that's going to cause a lot of moms and dads to come to my clinic and be extremely afraid about what this means for their kid. And I, I know you would probably say good. You know, well, I'd say frankly, good if they still have a is. choice, right? If they, if they have a choice to pull their kid out, which kid, parents do all the time, I'd say great. If this actually concerns you and this is not inaccurate information, then act on it while you still can. Because right. for so, so many people, it's too late. Today, I'm at the NCTE Walk with Dr. Chris Nowinski, who's the CEO and founder of the Concussion Legacy Foundation and on a mission to NCTE. And also, I'm joined by Dr. Kevin Bickhart, who is an assistant professor and sport and behavioral neurologist at the UCLA Brain Sport Program. This is a good one. Please stick around. Most importantly, stay safe. Be well. A real good lead into this would probably be the whole Tua Tagovailoa situation. Um, you know, and for people that don't know, Tua Tagovailoa, Miami Dolphins quarterback, um, had a, a concussion that wasn't diagnosed on the field. Um, this was last year, and then he went back out there. Thank God he didn't have a concussion that same game. But then the following game, and you called it on Twitter, you said, hey, this was a concussion. He shouldn't even be ba ba back in there right now. Uh, certainly not the next game. Sure enough, he went back out there, had another concussion, and you know the visual was, um, I think, s super striking, right? And throughout all society, everyone saw you know, two on his back um, in that d get posturing. Um, which is always super scary and a sign of a brain injury, right? Super serious. Um, so, and then you said he definitely shouldn't come back the third game, and he came back, and sure enough, he had a third concussion. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, thir the, the third game question was more focused on what was good for Tua, not even just from a medical perspective, right? Just the idea that at that point, three concussions in the season, most teams will tag you as a concussion case, rightly or wrongly. Yeah. And so I think he had an out where he could have said, I need to let two in five days is insane. I need to let my brain rest. And at least then if he got a concussion next season, he could still have a career with him. So, you know, now everyone's waiting. If he gets a concussion early in the season, like you're going to see everyone lose their confidence in him. And it's not even his fault. It was because he was mismanaged. Yeah. Uh, where do you think, I want to hear your perspective on where you think the weak link in that concussion protocol, like obviously the concussion, NFL concussion protocol did not work for him, right? Yeah. Where do you think the weak link is if you think that there is specifically a weak link that caused uh, that entire disaster? Yeah, well, I think the weak link is the design itself in the sense, and it's not necessarily a weak link, it's just, it's just on purpose. Players are paranoid about being held out when they're healthy because they know it costs them the reputation and it'll cost them money. And so they've designed the protocol that you can have some on-field signs that I would say, if this is a child, you never put that person back out, but they can go to the locker room and then have a doctor determine, you know, is it still happening, is it real, or can they go back? And so you're always gonna get people going back who shouldn't, but it prevents too many people who, sh who should be allowed to play from being out. And so, it's a choice the players make because at that point they're strictly playing for money and you know this isn't about the game at all this is about men's careers and so I, I accept that that's a choice that they made but the weak link if we're looking at the protocol as an example for everybody the weakest link is that they don't take on field signs of concussion seriously enough so when Tua got up you know I went through Twitter and I said here's five things he did that would have by themselves made you suspect concussion and remove him from play the fact that there were five means you don't put that person back in no matter what. But as the, as the protocol was written, there was a loophole, and the doctors inappropriately used that loophole, suggesting that a different injury had caused him to stumble and ignored the head shake and ignored the other things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you know, his, his life may be permanently changed. We won't know, you know for 50 years. Yeah. What do you think? I agree completely. I mean in my opinion that's one of those 
black and white situations where you have somebody who's showing obvious signs that really it'd be hard to convince anybody it was from a uh, back injury or something else. So uh, to me, it was a concussion, should have been taken out. Um, weak link, you know, I don't know the, the uh, protocol well enough and, and the incentive structure well enough to know, but I can make some guesses. And I think at the end of the day, you know, he should have been in the protocol. He should have been out for the seven to 10 days that it takes to kind of accurate, you know, uh, clearly move through and, and become um, asymptomatic or, or stable. And then, you know, see how he does back in the game. Yeah, and what's super surprising is, you know, the, the independent neurotrauma consultant, right? This is something that was implemented relatively recently by the NFL, uh, and it's uh, supposed to be to avoid these circumstances, right? If there's any sort of influence, uh, especially coming from a star player like Tua, you know, on the team doctor, right? This is a relationship that you're going to have to continue. Um, having an independent neurotrauma consultant to step in and say he needs to be out, regardless of what he's saying. We know what we saw. He needs to be out. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I agree that in that situation they made a mistake, but I also accept that there will be mistakes made by human beings in clinical evaluations, mm. right? So I think the, 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 the probably the biggest takeaway from this is that there's a massive cultural problem that still exists in football in the sense that those concussion signs happen in front of everybody. Everybody works with the Dolphins, every coach, every other player, and every medical person on staff. And the fact that nobody, like, w like – when he started coming back out, said, whoa, 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 <laughs> like, even if you don't think he had a concussion, you can't be certain, and why would we risk our franchise on the last quarter of this game? Why not see if delayed symptoms come out? Let's give him a day. So the fact that they, that they rolled the dice so aggressively in so early in the season is, is sort of like just, ter it's, it's terrible hu human being management and terrible football <laughs> management. And so it's a sign that everybody still thinks concussions are nothing. Yeah. Even if it was his lower back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the stumble afterwards suggested some either imbalance centrally or right. lower extremity weakness from a spine, you know, uh, stunning or compression or something like that. So to me, it was off enough that I would have. What's really surprising is that they already didn't have ataxia or some sort of you know, medical terminology that defines no, imbalance. They did. they did. They just changed the word to ataxia. They had uh, gross motor instability. Hmm. Okay. Which can mean a lot of things, though, right? Well, not, they, not they necessarily they just imbalance. That's what they thought by changing it, that maybe they'll, there, there's that window where it, it could be gross motor but not ataxia. Okay. You know, yeah. Do you think it's going to do anything changing that, that terminology no, at all? No, I, 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 it, I think it's the learning that's coming from the, atten the negative attention around this. Okay. That's mm -hmm. gonna make everyone a little more uh, conservative, conservative sure. in their return. Yeah. You mentioned um, you don't know if Tua Tagovailoa will have permanent damage moving forward from these three concussions. Can you extrapolate a little bit more on that? Yeah, well, you know, there's sort of, the, you know, we talk about two trajectories, right? There's the multiple concussion trajectory. What does that do to you? And I think, you know, we pretty much agree that the more brain injuries you have, the worse off you are. Mm -hmm. And the closer together they are, the worse off you are. And so will that influence um, any chronic symptoms or neurodegenerative disease or make him at risk that another hit, you know, say it's a car accident in five years, suddenly that one causes permanent symptoms. So, y you know, we have to respect that every concussion matters. And so we, and you don't, even if he says he's recovered, we're not sure he's recovered and he's now at risk for future things. The, the CT question is a whole different question that is really not related to diagnosed concussions, but a lot of hard hits in a short period of time is never good. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just the idea that brain injuries play out over a lifetime. They don't just play out now. And it, it, even if it knocks two or three good years of life uh, you know, off the end of your life because of some, some scenario, um, it's, it's meaningful. Yeah. Um, so do you think that he should retire? No. No, I think um, there's very few, like, you definitely should retire signs, and the doctors are pretty good at those. We were just talking about, you know, a couple before we started. So I think it's more of a what, you know, I think he should be going to the best doctors and having honest discussions, and those doctors should be telling him, I, there's nothing on your scan that tell me you can't play, but the question is, you know, there are risks going forward. Here's what we know, and are those risks worth it for you? Yeah. And if he chooses they are, you know, then God bless him, you know, and I wish him the best. But he needs people to be honest with him. And 
because there's so much speculation in long term, you know, who know, you know, I'm not sure the stories he's getting. But I mean, his recent whoever he just recently saw a few weeks ago mentioned he, his quote from the podium was, I was told as a quarterback, I'm not at greater risk because I don't take as many hits. And that's not true. Like, I can tell you that's not true. You know, we have another study coming out looking at, you know, exposure by position. And A, I think almost all, if not all, of our NFL quarterbacks have had it. But B, it, you know, just being a quarterback doesn't make you safe. The style at which, which you play matters. The style at which you played until you got to the NFL matters. He's been a running quarterback. He's taken lots of hits. So just, just the idea that he's, like, somehow protected because he doesn't get hit in practice is, is, is not – being fair to him because he is going to take more blindside hits than anybody else on that field and we've seen it mm. and those are going to be bigger magnitude and and could have you know more significance with ct we just don't know the relationship between number and magnitude and risk yeah what do you, what do you think about um recommending retirement the other point i'll bring up is that um the hits that may matter or may cause concussive injury aren't just the head-to-head -head. and so for a quarterback like him who is on the run He's thrown to the ground, and he's got the torsional or twisting forces on the, the body, head, and neck. And so that in and of itself can cause a concussion without actually having head-to-head. -head. So I agree that, that that advice he got um, or his interpretation is probably not accurate. The um, interesting thing about concussions and long-term outcomes, I think, is how many is too many? You know, and, and um, is there a gradient of severity within concussion that actually has some impact on long-term outcomes. It's just, it's a hard thing to study because, you know, really what you'd want to do is take one group, not ethically, of course, but one group and concuss them and the other group not, have all other things being equal, and then see how they fare, you know, longitudinally, pro prospectively, watching them go into college and then go on to you know their jobs and careers and how they adjust and succeed and so on and so forth and measure their cognitive abilities and autopsy them after they pass away and that would be the ideal gold standard of, of understanding this thing but we can't do that ethically you know only in in animals um, and so I think we're left wondering I mean there's no real answer to this question of should he play or not it is a personal decision um, for me, I, I, I err on the side, uh, you know, I agree with Chris's opinion that let's see what he can do, but don't have misinformation that he's not going to get hit or be hopeful or blind to the fact that he's going to be thrown to the ground a bunch. He's already, you know, encountered uh, or accumulated a significant exposure. And so it's something he has to continue to think about. And um, it, in my opinion, for all of these cases, multiple individual concussions or TBIs of any magnitude and repetitive subconcussive blows, you really need to follow this with baseline and, and ongoing testing or observation, some type of evaluation to understand if this person's changing. Because I think the only real accurate information we have to predict how they're going to be down the road is some stagnant, progressive, long-term problem. So um, uh, you mentioned subconcussions, and I think that's, a, that's important to delineate for everybody is that certainly concussions are bad, but when um, we're talking about CTE and its relation to repetitive head injuries, I think we're more so speaking about the exposure to subconcussions. Well, actually, we're, we're not using subconcussive anymore mm. unless we're specifically talking about really mild hits. Mm. We use non-concussive. Sure. There's some really interesting studies using sensors out there I, I, that I think will help m s make CT make more sense to people, which is the idea that Concussions, you know, happen on a spectrum, right? Some people take really small hits and they cause concussions. Some people take explosive hits, and it's the hardest hit they took all season. But some studies would suggest the average concussions happening about the 90th percentile of the hits you took over a season. So if you imagine that a football player over two seasons takes 2,000 hits to the head, has one diagnosed concussion, the data would suggest they took 200 hits that were harder than that concussion. If you think about it that way, CT makes a ton of sense. If we think concussions are bad for you because they cause a physical brain injury, what about those other 200 hits that probably cause the same microscopic brain injury but just not in places that you would feel or notice or be able to measure or, you know. So I think, I think that's why non-concussive hits would be the more logical cause of CT than diagnosed concussions. So just as severe, just not exacerbating symptoms from the, the actual head injury. 
Right. Well, just well, no. It's it's basically the idea that we're causing silent traumatic brain injuries. Right. Right. Like I think that's widely accepted in the neurological community at this mm-hmm. point. I was just uh, to have a conversation with one of the top people on it. It's a, so you know because it, it's sort of naive to think like okay, eighty six billion neurons, trillions of connections. I take a hit and I'm going to feel one of those neurons die. Like right. no, of course not. So if you accept that you aren't going to feel every brain injury, then I think it's safe to say. We have a ton of brain injuries we don't feel. We have a ton of brain injuries we do feel and never tell anybody. And then we have these really rare times when we show enough signs that someone stops us or we actually volunteer information. Do you think the number of concussions with symptoms is a proxy for the number of non-concussive head impacts that someone might have had over no. a time period? No. No? I don't, I don't think there's been shown to be much of a correlation. I mean, in theory, like in a football player, like in general, yes. But mm-hmm. there's plenty of people who get a lot of concussions with way fewer hits. And there's some people in our brain bank who were shown to basically be unconcussible during their career. You know, like some people are gen- you know, genetically, uh, we hear about like boxers, they got a, you know, a strong jaw. Strong they can take out. all sorts of hits and they'll never be knocked out or they'll never complain of a symptom. Those people are probably at the most risk, yeah. right? Yeah. Some people would argue the glass brain, you know, people who actually get concussed easier are in some ways protected because they protected don't make it as many brain. rounds. They may not have as long of a career. Right. Or uh, especially when you see older fighters and they develop a glass jaw, mm-hmm. is that a protective mechanism to stop the sort of non no, <laughs> I, I wish it was protective. Have. I think it's desperation. <laughs> really? You don't, you don't think it's like a protective mechanism potentially going on? You think it's just I just think the, 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 the burden of the burden of injury? When your brain injures, your brain can't overcome it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but do you have anything to add regarding these non-concussive versus concussive uh, injuries and how they relate to CTE? Well, I do think these are two different animals and should be treated differently. At least as we, as far as we understand the literature, you know. Concussions don't have a one-to-one correlation with a lot of things. Number of concussions or age of concussions, things like that, don't correlate to long-term prospective outcomes mm-hmm. and um, only loosely in some cases correlate to a lear- little bit earlier onset of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, but not necessarily of, um, of CTE and so on. So I think that concussions are really important to consider, especially a concussive injury that one requires accurate diagnosis and good rehabilitation so that symptoms don't linger because that can be really debilitating but it's a completely different thing than CTE and so I think if I can just take one tangent the TUA case really brings up this important thing for the community as a whole the players coaches uh, and and everybody watching as well as community physicians concussions and post-concussive syndrome is not CTE that's something completely different and so when you conflate the two, um, it, it can cause a lot of fear and, and mismanagement. Whereas the non-concussive injuries, the accumulation over time, the thousands of hits uh, over the course of a season or a military tour, um, that is an, another thing. And that's hard to quantify. And looking at the clinical manifestations of that and the long-term risk of any dementia, let alone CTE on autopsy, uh, is a different line of research that requires different methods and it has you know challenges because of the long term that you need to follow somebody um, so I think those two things are different once we start talking about concussions we can keep it in that bucket and talk about recovery in the immediate sense and not long-term progressive neurodegenerative conditions because we, we actually that's a leap and we don't really know whereas the subconcussive or non-concussive injuries um, w- that's another conversation we should have it yeah that's an excellent point the um we have a lot of patients, right? We're clinicians, so we're seeing a lot of these guys, and they're having either, you know, they're wondering, do I, st- am I, uh, do I have CTE because I have persistent symptoms after my concussion, right? And you know, especially considering the significant media attention, um, I think it's logical for them to sort of think that, right? Versus CTE, it's sort of this exposure that you have over a significant amount of time period, and no real symptoms persist from those incidents, but then over time, then you begin to have symptoms. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. It's been complicated to try to communicate these risks, right? Yeah. Because there is, besides people dying and, and getting diagnosed with CT, like nothing about a football game will bring up CTE, right? right? So CT, a, a, and even er, when we started doing this, you know, in 2007, when it became like a national conversation, 
it was the same time the NFL started putting in concussion protocols, and we thought that maybe like Ted Johnson's concussion mismanagement might have had something to do with his chronic symptoms. It might have something to do with CT. And now, you know, a few years we figured out, no, those probably aren't related. Right. Um, and at the same time, we were trying to push people to get concussions to go to doctors. Yeah. Right? So yeah. it's like while the CT conversation is happening, there's also this concussion conversation happening. And I'm, I'm really glad that patients go to doctors now for concussions and then can be told by doctors, no, 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 you don't have to worry about CT. Right. Right. But it, the, the idea that you can, you know, communicate that sort of precision, you know, through the media, because it's not like the NFL is helping us do this. Right. Um, it, it, it's, un it's understandable this happened. And, and um, you know, something we try to counter in all the messaging that we do is that if you don't play, get hit in the head thousands of times, like, don't worry about this part. Right. So um, I think that, you know, that leads into the go a good conversation. And obviously, this is a big debate within the scientific community, I think, regarding the causal relationship between repetitive head injuries and uh, the development of CTE. Um, and I think it's really important when you talk about, you know, what is the prevalence, especially in some of the, NF you know, in the NFL players, especially, right? Um, you know, a, a lot of the media headlines that I come across make it seem that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, upwards of 90%. Most people in the NFL will have CTE. Um, so I think that making that distinction and uh, is going to be really important. Can you speak a little bit more on that? Yeah, yeah. That was you know, something we learned when we published our, our 110 and 111 study is that when you're in science all day long, like you understand how sa sampling biases and, and are built into the conversation. Mm -hmm. But when you're... Uh, you know, reading a headline, it can be harder to realize of those studied and those studied are different than the people who are not studied. Right. The, but the football one's interesting because, um, you know, when you said it, you know, that most people have it, like I actually suspect that most, most NFL players do have it. Mm. That's more than 50%. Mm. Because we're getting a window into what the minimum is and the minimum's high, right? Because we're still now getting, you know, we're near you know, at about 400 NFL players and it's still over 90% that have had it. And the and, and various clinical symptoms, and we, I know like we track also the demen public dementia cases we don't get. There's a ton, mm. right? So, I think you know football is a unique population, and I think we've also shown very clearly that there's a dose response relationship. It's it's far fewer in our college, it's far fewer in our high school. It's definitely a minority of our high school players. Um, so it is again one of those issues of this is the science, this is the data. That's what we give to the newspapers, and then they and then they do their headline, and then they add the caveats in paragraph two or three, and, and mm -hmm. but the caveats don't become part of the conversation. Right. And so again, you try to get better each time you communicate a new study to try to move those caveats up and to have long conversations with reporters. But you know, this again, there's you, you you tell people the facts and the truth, and then you and then you do your best to make sure that that's exactly what reaches the people. Right. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, me, uh, you know, the media coverage of science is challenging you, you know they're vying for eyeballs on the page and the headline that grabs people's attention and so um, I understand the 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 beast there but um, uh, what happens you know in clinic is that people will come in after the Philip Adams case for example where there's you know s the headlines are severe uh, CT at the time of the shootings you know, as was the one of the headlines for um, a, a description of his his injury and his illness and and the things he had done, and so people got you know up in arms about their case. You know, military people who had blast exposures and uh, ex NFLers that came to clinic said, "Look, you know, we're worried. We have it too. I got into sub sub substance abuse after I retired, and you know, I'm just I've never been the same. I'm kind of uh, a little empty inside. I, I can't." feel things towards my kids. Um, do I have CTE? You know, really concerned about that. And, um, you know, I watched at that time, I watched some of the concussion, concussion Legacy Foundation videos, which I really appreciated because I was getting the feeling, man, you know, the message is so dramatic right now, it's creating a mass hysteria, you know, that, that some small amount of lesions, stage one or two, in the frontal lobes is causing psychosis and you know violent behaviors to the point where people are committing suicide or homicide and that's the message coming down the chain through the media to these people who don't feel right after they retire and then feel suddenly hopeless and fearful that they're gonna crack or undergo some long dementing illness where they're not gonna remember their family members just like on 
TV for Alzheimer's or something like that. And so I, so I watched some of the, the footage and um, educational programs that you guys had, and I thought, that's a really balanced message. You know, basically, most people on the videos online are saying, go see a physician, get an expert opinion. You know, there's tons of things that could be causing your symptoms, many of which, probably most of which, are reversible. In fact, the minority of cases are actually any dementing illness at all. And, um, and then Dr. McKee's recent statement after the, uh, the newer study with the 340 out of... 365, I think? 345 out of 342. Sorry. Yeah, so the 91.7 percent <laughs> of the uh, players in the um, in the brain bank had a CTE diagnosis. Uh, there was a um, an article, and, and Dr. McKee's quote got in there and said, "Hey, look, you know the the headline grabbing cases are just that. These are cases. They're the the dramatic minority." Uh, and so, to me, I dig into those cases and think about it a little bit because. Uh, my other specialty is uh, neurodegenerative disease or neurobehavioral uh, uh, diseases that occur in 50 and 60 year olds like frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy body, where there's a behavioral aspect at the forefront. And so they get misdiagnosed for years as psychiatric conditions and so on. But if they were to have a you know NFL career or some prior sport career or contact uh, exposure and things like that, you might start thinking CTE. And um, I've seen patients with you know razor thin frontal lobes like they've got such great atrophy and none of them are violent you know th they're they're not murdering people or committing suicide it's it's very rare for people with frontal temporal dementia so i'm wondering in these egregious cases like uh, philip adams and aaron hernandez where was this deposition you know where in the brain what was it like lo located in a very specific area that caused this violent behavior or was it they had you know some nasty childhood experiences and other factors that led to narcissism and some other antisocial personality disorder stuff that caused some, yeah. you know, maybe exacerbated by multiple head injuries. Well, uh, no, let's let let's dig in on that because like uh, Hernandez has very clear social parts. If Adam's case doesn't necessarily. So I think what what's interesting about uh, so I'll tell you just sort of what the conversation that we're having, which is. You know, you're, I think you're absolutely right. Like the end stage CT, like does is well. This, like, I'd like to say it's not associated with violence, but we just helped an NFL wife whose husband tried to choke her to death and mm. put him mm. in a nursing home, and he, was, he died months later. Mm. Like that happens, yeah. as you know. Uh, but again, it's rare. And you know, but then there's also the idea that um, when you have CTE, there's also other brain damage that comes with it, right? The path to CT involves again thousands of head impacts, and so. We certainly, like, we're very focused on, and we're trying to better understand, but it doesn't have the great pictures or scale, white matter damage, right? We see tons of white matter generation in these folks, and we see it more associated mm -hmm. with behavioral changes. And so sort of the general feeling right now, just to maybe skip ahead a little bit, is that, like, yeah, this idea that CT, severe CT is definitely associated with cognitive impairment and definitely associated with dementia. I don't think people are questioning that. And then the question is, what's going on with these folks from 20 to 60 or 20 to yeah. 50? And the message that we're trying to push out to those folks is whether or not you have CT, it, it, the, 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 t the line between your behavior and tau pathology is very is not strong. Yeah. But there's these other things that you could have done in your brain that you could be related. But either way, it's not, this isn't the progressive point. This isn't the end of your life. This isn't the, the, you're guaranteed to go any direction. If you can get through the mental health challenges through treatment, through medical doctors and a better understanding, you can have a, a nice fine life. Yeah. And so that's what we're messaging those, those midlife people. But when we talk about someone like Philip Adams, like remember the FBI, like he was writing crazy journals and the FBI looked through it and they, they couldn't yeah. find any reason why any of this happened. Mm -hmm. And the only like, evidence is not only CT but he had uh, you know he had a frontal lobe atrophy right and you know the the, the the homicide suicide thing like I got to tell you I'm colored by my first couple of years in this which is the idea that you know let's remember there was Mike Webster and Terry Long in uh, he died in 02 and 05 mm -hmm. you know we know Webster's horror lo story Terry Long multiple suicide attempts none of them is because they thought they had CT then Andre Waters takes his life in 2006 before there's ever any news around CT and then Justin Strelzik's getting chased by the police having a psychiatric, psychiatric episode uh, in his late 30s before anyone, and that happened actually before Waters died and his brain was just kept. And then 10 days after I incorporated the foundation, 
Chris Benoit, who I personally knew for five years, was a great guy, kills his wife and uh, son and himself. Right? Those are the first five CT cases in America. Right? So and none of all those happened before anyone was talking about CT. So the idea that those things aren't related, you know, just on its face, like consider, you know, now we have we have a lot of murders in this brain bank, right? And they all had have, have have an FCT. So it may not be it's you're right, it's probably not the tau pathology, but is it other elements of brain damage or I mean, I have to imagine there's some there might be something tying those together besides just randomness and they were all athletes. Yeah, you do wonder what brings, you know, what I've always, I played football growing up and I loved it. I loved to hit, you know, I, I was told at the age of nine when I started in, uh, I think it was junior peewees by my coach, where else in the world can you hit someone as hard as you want and not go to jail? Yeah. And so they coaches nine, love that phrase. We all heard it. At <laughs> 10 years old, I'm thinking this is where I want to be. You know, I want to hit as hard as I can. And so. I remember thinking that and um, enjoying that the violence of the game it was you, you get everything out there, but I think um, so that makes me wonder: is violence part of what drives people to a game like football or some other combat sports? Um, it's kind of this tendency. You know, I've looked up, I tried to actually uh, you know review the literature on that, and all I can find was a few studies that suggest that people. Uh, who had played football aren't any more violent, don't, get, don't break the law any more than, than others. And I think maybe they're part of the program and you know things are covered up like Aaron Hernandez's first few uh, things were, but, um, but maybe not. So I, anyway, that's one question that comes up is, is playing the game in and of itself and what drives people to play the game a precursor to you know, a vulnerability to violence. And um, I like the idea of thinking, what else aren't we measuring other than tau pathology that could be correlated to that type of behavior? But one thing that I read recently was um, the article where uh, the BU group and, um, and others tried to validate the 2014 uh, TES, the tra Traumatic Cephalopathy Syndrome criteria, and came up with, you know what? cognition and a progressive course of 12 months or more are really the things that make diagnosing in life by clinical criteria more accurate to the uh, CTE pathology. And uh, in the supplement, it has all of the uh, clinical symptoms that were reviewed, like violence and irritability, impulsivity, aggressive, aggressiveness, things like that. And for the CTE and non-CTE cases, a lot of those things were lockstep. Yeah. And uh, post-concussive syndrome, in fact, was more prominent in people who had played sports but not were not diagnosed with CT on, on autopsy. So I was just trying to like put all that together. But the, the pathology and the clinical phenomenon seems to not be correlated yet. Well, there's a couple ways to look at that. Uh, what the, the, when I look at that scale, what I see is the person who makes the most calls to families is that there's a there's a profile of what people think CT is, mm -hmm. and those are the people at the brain bank. So mm -hmm. they're all like that's why you get 80, 90 percent of all of these symptoms, is because that's who's donating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do we do have some we're working on studies that'll have more pure control groups. Mm -hmm. So you can say like oh no, I, so then the question will be like well you know who are these people who are negatives. Why are they that way? Because we know that, like, and people are going to end up these places without getting a CTE. Yeah. So there is a lot to tease out there. I think y the question on um, football and uh, and people, there's two an uh, two ways to think about that. One is, if you and I do have violence, you know, a little bit in our DNA, it's like it doesn't surprise me if things go wrong. If you take somebody who's already got a impulse for this and then start to give them some brain damage, right? Like that would make sense. And then the bigger question of like versus population, population is almost always the wrong control group, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. for, for, for elite athletes. And I think we've seen this over and over again. And actually I just reviewed a study that was rejected because there were three buckets, football players, non-contact sport athletes, regular people. Mm -hmm. Football players and regular people had the same levels of depression, all these other things, but the football players were much worse than the non-contact sport mm -hmm. athletes. Mm -hmm. But this researcher who's got a bias for this was only comparing it to the control group and I don't think realized he had the data for the, for the better control group, which <laughs> is the other elite athletes who were hit in the head. Mm -hmm. And that came out today, I don't want to put a date on this conversation, but a study came out from um, researchers at Columbia and the Mayo Clinic on hockey players. Mm -hmm. 
and they found that they compared ways, uh, ages of death and ways of death for fighters versus non-fighters in, in the NHL. They found that um, not only were the fighters dying younger by 10 years, but they died in completely different ways, right? So there were 11 of the 21 deaths of, of fighters who've played since 1967 was things that they said, not us, that they thought could be related to CT, neurodegenerative disease for a couple of them, suicide, um, four auto accidents, only one in the control group, and uh, overdoses. And, and for neurodegenerative disease, suicide, and overdoses, there were zero <laughs> in the non-fighters, mm -hmm. right? Because there's great benefits to sports participation. And so if you do sports and don't get hit in the head, you, can, you should expect to live longer and healthier. So, um, so anyway, so I think, and I, you know, when we talk about regular control groups, let's remember when you're comparing like NFL players, like these are people who through 25 were the best physically, genetically, you know, never got sick, you know, had great attitudes, you know, all that stuff. And that's not the population necessarily. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anyway, but again, it's, it's more like trying to have a, a useful conversation around this, right? Because yes, not everything is CT and, but there's bar people suffering and how do we, have the best, um, how do we move this forward to reduce harm for people and also not create other harm for people worrying about things. You, you came out with yeah. a, you, you put out, you published a really cool paper um, applying the Bradford, the Bradford Hill criteria uh, to CTE uh, and repetitive head impacts, where repetitive head impacts were, the, uh, were an environmental factor and the Bradford Hill criteria was used with um, uh, smoking cigarettes and lung cancer. Thought it was a super cool paper, Thank and um, you give a lot of you know there's a certain criteria, so there's, there's a lot of pillars. Uh, but what do you think, out of that criteria, um, is sort of the best point pointing towards a causal relationship between repetitive head injuries and CTE? If you could point out one. Yeah, I mean, I think I think even Bradford uh, or sorry, Austin Bradford Hill um, said dose response and specificity were I think two of the more important ones to him. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so the idea that the, the more you're exposed to the exposure, you know, the environmental factor, the greater your odds, which I think has been shown in boxing and football and hockey. And then um, specificity, which is the idea like the location of the lesion, is there any other explanation for it? Is it being seen outside of this population and why? And, and I think this is again one of those where you actually, if you actually go through the literature, even though people like to say people who didn't get hit in the head get CT, Dr. McKee then did a, another review after mine where she showed that 97% of all CT cases had extraordinary RHI, you know, sports or otherwise. And then that 3%, it's a handful of single cases. It's one study by Grant Iverson that claimed six of eight random people had it, which statistically is like a one in a trillion shot, <laughs> you know, that that could be true. So I think there's either misdiagnosis or something going on there. And so there's just so, there, you know, and, and if you think about this issue, We've been, it's been high profile for 15 years. Everyone's been funding brain banks to go back and look and try to prove this is high in the population. But the, all the large studies have now shown it's less than 1% of the population who has this. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think that specificity factor two is also very uh, important. Yeah, what do you think about that? I think um, you know, just the, the, the message that um, towing the line between raising awareness and bringing attention and concern to this area of science and, and human experience that has major limitations in trying to study it um, is, is crucial. And, and that's what I appreciate so much about your path and everything you've done. Um, and then on the flip side, the, um, the challenge is then causing concern and misdiagnosis and overdiagnosis um, and so I, I think the Bradford study is cool and it's like just another way of trying to really um, put a stake in the ground and say, hey, listen, we need to continue to fund research and get longitudinal controlled or uh, case control or cohort designs and look back in banks and, and try to understand the prevalence of this thing, the specificity, dose response, clinical correlation, all of these things that are at this point still I think pretty loose um, n we all need it we all need it because either families need to know or community physicians need to be able to have a framework to look at a person and say hey look you know this could be one of the common neurodegenerative diseases that we see often or a psychiatric condition or vitamin deficiency or this could be another phenomenon that probably at the end of the day we'd still treat the same way at this point in neurobehavior 
but um, we'd educate the person that they're not doomed for some progressive condition that's never going to relent. We actually don't know how this thing progresses. We don't know if it starts early and then progresses you know, over the course of 10 years to death or it starts late in some people. We don't know why. We don't know resilient factors. So I think navigating that, um, the, the Bradford study to speak specifically, I think is another um, stake in the ground or another, another uh, supportive uh, article in this, this big literature that says we need more. Well, I, I would look at it differently. I don't think we commented on like the clinical course. I mean, I appreciate all, all those ideas. I mean, all, everything you said is true. It's just, for me, what the reason I wrote it was to get people to appreciate that um, ca if we accept cause and effect, we can prevent it. Because the, the point that all these things are such a problem, right, in trying to help, you know, we have our helpline at the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Anyone can reach out for free, and, and we give them personal guidance. We send them to you when they're in L.A., right? Mm -hmm. Like, we try to get them to the best clinician who has an understanding of brain injury and or CT and can give them the best diagnosis. But... Um, you know, one, once you have, once you're at risk for it or have it or start having these symptoms, like uh, we don't know how to fix you, right? And we can get into like I try to go. Th I just went through this with my college roommate, and the captain of our team. Like, I sent him to our best doctors, and they could not pull him out of an alcoholism spiral, and he's dead. Hmm. And he had stage two CT, right? So, this um, I, that scares the hell out of me. And so, the Bradford Hill, my primary goal is to get people to say, okay. Um, it is cause and effect, and therefore we can control who's getting it in the future. And that's why, on the heels of that, we launched our campaign, Stop Hitting Kids in the Head. Mm -hmm. It was just the idea that, okay, this does matter. Like, all these concussions and the absence of CT aren't good for you. And then if you do get CT, like, that's really not good for you. Again, you can still live a good enough life, but it's gonna, it's not the gonna be your best life, right, that it could have been. And so, um, so that's why we pushed the prevention side. And again, the best part of that, you mentioned, you know, controversy around cause and effect. I, I have to say that I think, I think that's been laid to, laid to bed, right? Because one of the things we did is the CDC had already put out fact sheets saying the evidence suggested cause and effect, but no one listened because the CDC puts out fact sheets, but they don't necessarily have the same promotional capacity or, or mandate that, uh, that other groups have. And so then I, I just happened to be at um, the Tau Consortium meeting, you know, just trying to you know, get smarter on all the real geniuses around Tau, and the paper came out, and I started sharing with people, and they were saying, oh, this is great, this is, this, you know, I w you know, some of them were like, I was already convinced, the other ones like, they give, they give it a read, and I realized, like, you know, it's one thing for us to say, it's not, but the NINDS at that point had said associate on their website, and I thought, you know, I, I suspect that they, you know, Walter Korshetz had said in the past he believed cause and effect was established in 2012, who was the head of NINDS, so I said, so I got, I went around this meeting and got all, you know, 40 of the world's best Tau experts, super well-respected people. And I said, do you agree with our, that cause and effects have been established beyond any reasonable doubt? And, and they signed it. And we sent this letter to the NDS. And then a few months later, they, they mentioned, we've updated our website. That's all I said. We've updated our website. <laughs> <laughs> and they had the yeah, cause effects been established. So I figured, I figured, if we got CDC and NINDS aligned, who is left to question this, mm -hmm. right? And I, and I was very fascinated that last month, the Australian Football League, who had been the biggest critic of this, if you know the whole Paul McCrory yeah. background and all yeah. that, said in their statement to the Australian Senate, because they're having hearings about this, because mm -hmm. they think this is a problem, they said they believe, they agree with the NANDS statement. So I'm like, all right, the dominoes are falling. So the people who are still left saying, I don't believe in cause and effect, I question what, you know, how are they, what logic are they using to say that? Mm -hmm. and, I th mm -hmm. and I would argue that whatever evidence they're trying to cite to say that's not cause and effect is proven, it's flawed. That there's some misunderstanding in their understanding because the people way smarter than me are now saying cause and effect established. And I just put together, again, with, with uh, 14 great co-authors, like just a, a review for something that I already believed before I did the review, but now I believe more strongly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't believe in cause and effect, or I know you don't represent um, other you know, scientists and people that might not believe in it, that is established just yet, but what would you wanna see from the evidence? What do you think those people would wanna see from the evidence in order to establish that causal relationship? Uh, I, it's, it's not that I don't believe in cause and effect, so um, it, it's, you know, I think the ideal so just to respond to you know what you were, uh, and, I, and I didn't realize that you didn't, so I wasn't trying to say. You, no, I, I wasn't no, trying no, to turn no. this I don't, into I'm, a thing. I'm not even saying that <laughs> no. he doesn't, but he's very familiar, I think, with both camps. 
Yeah, right. I think it's an important thing to really kind of think through this and the repercussions. So you said, let's you know get this cause and effect uh, consensus you know on the books and and in the public so that there's really no question for prevention standpoint and then uh, which I, I agree with all of that completely and if, we, if we're there that's great you know that's a major milestone and uh, I mean no matter what I support the general idea because hitting your head as we all can imagine just from a common sense standpoint repeatedly is it doesn't sound like a good idea but the question that I really kind of keep coming back to is when does it happen how many of the hits do you need and what does the clinical course actually look like because some people live to 80 and have stage one two you know and some people um, have 15 years of uh, NFL exposure and don't have CTE and so there are so many questions there and, and then the challenge of actually correlating pathology retrospectively to clinical data is is a major gap in understanding the course whereas Alzheimer's disease where we've got some biomarkers we've got a good signature of, of brain atrophy and, and pet abnormalities and CSF findings where you can say okay this person has probable diagnosis and the phenotype looks like this there's about four or five of them and we could be fairly certain and treat accordingly. Um, I just don't feel, obviously, I think we'd all agree, we're not there with CTE. What's between us and getting there? That's one question. And then two, what are people doing with this cause and effect knowledge now? You know, we're kind of even more strongly saying, hey, head injuries are bad uh, and you could be doomed, I think is one, one interpretation people are getting from this. But I don't know if that's true that you could be doomed. Head injuries are definitely the head, but Yeah, well I think some people some people it's absolutely life destroying. You know, and, and again these are the people who reach out to us. These are people in their forties, fifties who are uh you know, I, I mean just remember there's a I a, a surgeon reached out to me, forty two, played college football, who couldn't remember the steps in his surgery anymore and he mm -hmm. stepped away from his practice. Mm -hmm. Like when medical yeah and that that and that's not the only medical doctor that reaches out. I, it's had to deal with well, an Ivy League medical doctor who, same problem. Like, so I think like, some people really have their lives, you know, again, the worst cases are, are not as, that co as common as the more Alzheimer's type of dad was started getting a little weird in his 50s, 60s, and w whatever. So, um, but to go back to the, the bigger picture question, um, which is, you know, trying to figure out like how many and all that stuff, I think, and then, the, and then addressing the clinical. From the how many part, like I don't find that question that interesting, and and like the why are there some stage ones in at eighty? I think we've seen from all of the diseases, like if, if we just are smoking and lung cancer provides a great way to understand a lot of this. Like it, the number of cigarettes is going to be different for everybody, and 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 so we will never know the number of hits for anybody. We'll never be able to predict it. We won't know it until it's too late, but we do know the more the worse off you are. And eventually we'll create some bands that'll show risk and all that stuff. So the idea that why do some people get it and some people don't, we don't know that for smoking and lung cancer. And everyone's been studying that for 50 years, right? It's because those are somewhat unanswerable questions. We're gonna find a ton of genes that have you 20% more risk and 10% more risk and, and some, no, some nerve protection. It's still not gonna answer the question, right? So the people who say, until we know all these things, we can't do anything. That's, I think, just looking at the science incorrectly. Right with the wrong questions and answers. The clinical side, I think, is 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 just a great discussion. Again, from from our perspective, foundation, we're trying to say that this is definitely somebody's problem, <laughs> and if you fit the, if you have these symptoms and it's not you know you're not getting answers, like consider this and go see somebody. Like that is, bec and I think you're right that we're finding out that you know some of the headline stories like it's probably not again the tau pathology, and it again it may not be anything that has to do with what's going on in your brain. Um, and it, it's always going to be a challenge. It's a differential diagnosis, a challenge for everything you're dealing with, right? Yep. Um, Any late onset psychiatric condition is a challenge. It is unusual at 40, 50 years old to have a new diagnosis of a psychiatric condition. So whenever that occurs and, you know, you're seeing that p person from a, you know, medical perspective, uh, it is a challenging differential. And so once you throw you know, contact sport in their history, that's where I think things get 
even more challenging potentially because you may overlook things that are treatable. But um, just to go back to the uninteresting questions, I agree, like some of these things are so esoteric, you know, we're never going to find answers and we could do polygenic gene scores to predict, you know, 5% protection and maybe that won't get us anywhere. Um, but I think the message that comes across when you talk about a delayed onset progressive neurodegenerative condition that may start with psychiatric or cognitive symptoms as early as 30, 40 years old um, gives off this notion that we know a lot about when this thing happens and how it progresses. Well, I would say the when the thing happens, like I think we've looked at enough young cases to know it's starting very young, right? 17 is the earliest we've seen the pathology. We now have, we'll have a new paper with dozens of cases of young people, right? So we know it's happening within five to 10 years of your exposure, and it's probably not starting after that. And the question though is, again, so that what that is gonna do is gonna cause a lot of awareness and, and good, um, I think, outcomes for creating uh, better rules for safety and everything like that. So that's the good side. The, the tougher side is that's gonna cause a lot of moms and dads to come to my clinic and be extremely afraid about what this means for their kid. And I, I know you would probably say, good, you know, well, I'd say frankly, good if they still have a is. choice, right? If they, if they have a choice to pull their kid out, which kid, parents do all the time, I'd say, great. If this actually concerns you and this is not inaccurate information, then act on it while you still can. Because right. for so, so many people, it's too late. Like, you know, you might be. And, yeah. and you know, again, like, we, you know, what, what does that mean, right? Like, some people will get full-blown dementia in their 50s. Like, it does happen from this disease. Yeah. And there's no treatment that's going to stop you from getting there. But again, it's not going to be the most common thing, but it's very real. Well, we just don't know if there's no treatment. We have not created a progressive um, natural history of this thing because we can't find in a living person the CT, obviously, as you know, it's the, the CTE pathology, and then march out their progression over time so that we say, usually, on average, people progress at this rate if their exposure was this, and we should expect yeah. you know, these things going forward, and then we can start intervening. If you don't intervene at this stage, then you know, right. they're in a bad well, I'm, position. Well, I'm referring to like if you have your dementia from a neurodegenerative disease, like no one's pulling you out of that if it's from Alzheimer's or it's true. You know, so Very I'm true. saying when you're there, like we don't have a way to pull you out. But I guess, and I guess part of the question too is that no, like even us as a scientific community, we are f far more focused on the messaging in this conversation then we are talking about the uh, the machine that's creating this disease, mm -hmm. right? And so I guess another question that's worth asking is, you know, obviously like it's impossible to completely nail again a precision communication for all these different groups with all these different at different ages and different times in their life. But are are we still fine with the NFL hiring you know the Mannings to go recruit six year olds to tackle football, which they did last fall? <laughs> like, do we think based on the evidence we've seen that was a good idea? And should we, should that also be part of the conversation? Is is it ethical to be recruiting kids to sports that cause CTE? Yeah, I think the question is also, and you, you brought it up in your Bradford Hill uh, paper, is is causation necessary to spur policy change, right? And I think you gave the you gave an example of. Uh, OSHA kept male workers from being sterilized by DBCP around 1977 based on eight workers with reproductive damage in one factory, right? Yeah. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting comparison. And um, well, thank you, Adam uh, Finkel, for that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and a good topic of discussion, right? Like, right. do we need the entire scientific community agreeing that there's a cause and effect uh, causation relationship between both, you know, repetitive head injury and CTE. Or, or does every, yeah, does, uh, yeah, I think the quote from Bre Breadville is just every I need to be dotted, every T need to be crossed before, exactly. we, start before we start doing, uh, you know, start doing something with the evidence that we have. You know, I know, I mean, I know your opinion on it because <laughs> I read the paper, right? But what do you think? No, I agree with that completely. I, I would not want to take the science to, you know, another 50 years to get all the I's dotted. Um, before we make some, you know, really honest and compassionate rules and regulations around how our kids are. But, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people in, in that camp are advocate. I'm not saying it's everybody, but I've heard that people want longitudinal studies, right? Mm -hmm. How long does a longitudinal study take 
um, that w- that would demonstrate, you know, youth tackle it ends up, you know, leading to a CTE diagnosis. That's a long time. Well, I, I would also ask, though, yeah, what would a longitudinal study tell us that we don't really know now, other than exact prevalence versus, you know, mm-hmm. bands of prevalence? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dose response, maybe a little better. Would yeah, but I mean, how much better does it need? Like, what what action could we take if we understood dose response a little better? You know, pulling kids if they're getting hit too much, limiting hits to a certain number. Um, but again, it, there won't be that. You know, could you, could you limit cigarettes to a certain number? Right, the horse. I feel like you know part of it is like it's the horse an is an addictive out of substance. I mean, it, you you could probably limit hits in a. I mean, like they already have. It, when I grew up, and probably when uh, when you did, just a few years before I did, uh, they had us going head to head. Uh, almost every practice we would do a ritual called Night of the Long Knives where... Oh, I don't know that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was basically um, everybody going at it full force in all the different drills right. where you end up going head to head easily and in oftentimes causing concussions. Um, and one of them was the machine gun drill where you had everyone line up in a circle. I know that one. one guy and uh, a number Call a number. Out. Blind yep. title. Yeah. 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 Call what a great drill that yeah. was. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Not if you were in the middle. <laughs> well, I yeah. don't know. Depends that's on how, you, that's how you proved you were a man. That's how <laughs> I got exactly. elected captain of my team <laughs> after exactly. a week of football. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but they don't do that anymore. Well, that uh, they don't do that where we are. Right. <laughs> they still and do So it. that would right. be one thing. I yeah. mean, that if we were to make that, you know, a, a an effort and yeah. a mission, that'd be... I think a completely reasonable thing that that's low hanging fruit. I mean, that's something that can be prevented. Is is uh, I, I agree 100. percent Is there a minimum age at which we have this conversation about lowering exposure versus eliminating exposure? Yeah, I mean, 12 is just a a number, in my opinion. I mean, it, it sh- there's a continuum of uh, maturation. So, I mean, you could biologically tag it to something else so well you know. driving smoking owning guns we all we everyone has to make policy decisions based on right. age so do you ha- you think 12 is i mean I, I no, i'm saying 12 is the one that's you know debated in the literature yeah you know because some of the studies use 12 as a cutoff if you played before 12 uh versus after 12 were you at risk higher risk of uh, cognitive symptoms later in life um so I don't know if 12 is the magic number or not. No, I'm asking what you what you think the magic number is. Is it, I mean because there's no, no magic risk. number. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean I guess like I, we we like what we try to push is this argument of you know you start hitting anyone in the head hundreds of times you're opening the door to uh, a season you're mm-hmm. opening up the door mm-hmm. to CT. When is it fair to open up C, the risk of CT to a child? Yeah. Versus saying don't do Oklahoma drill, do different drills. Like mm-hmm. take mm-hmm. their CT risk from you know x percent to half that like is that still fair yeah yeah yeah. i'd say high school you know that's uh, yeah. probably reasonable to start uh, allowing them to um have more drills more more exposure but you know i don't know that why so i would just be using my you know kind of personal opinion no, it's fine it's, it's only there is only personal opinion yeah. and i think that's a very fair one right yeah, yeah. so I, th- I agree with you that if we did a big educational push on hey let's get high school like Here's how you limit half your hits, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, if they would listen, but they don't believe that CT is caused by football in those mm-hmm. cases mm-hmm. because that's what they're being told by the NCAA. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mm-hmm. NFL's not telling them that anymore, but they told them for long enough that they right. still it still lives there. So um, there the isn't a will. The question is, do you will. need the hits to to get the five oh. kids over ten years from your high school to the NFL? You know, oh, I think you and I both know. No, yeah, like there's right. no correlation in number of hits you take in success, right? <laughs> or age you start in success. Right, right. So, so are you a freak athlete or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That's so you, you you think scouts, NFL scouts, college scouts would be able to you know analyze a high school flag football player? To well, I'm not know. even saying high school. I'm saying go ahead and play tackle in high school. Our policy tackle. is before high school play flag because no one's getting recruited off their 12 year old right. film. Right. Right. Yeah. It doesn't hurt the football ecosystem to have no one play tackle till 12 or 14. It yeah. doesn't at all, at all. It just hurts the helmet companies and it hurts the youth coaches who think that, you know, this is their life. And, and they and they think they're playing a positive role in those kids lives. And at that time, they are mm-hmm. while they're with them. The mm-hmm. question is, those coaches will be dead by the time they find out, did this harm those children? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so then that's why we don't learn from it. We have to learn from these autopsy studies. Yeah. yeah. What are some other things, you know, in s- banning, limiting um, uh, contact? What are some other things that you think maybe in the future could um, limit this repetitive head, head impact exposure? Um, helmets, 
I don't think, think helmets have a big role. I mean, I, I think the, the, the number one and number, uh, the, they're sort of, it, it's a, for me, a simple future, right? It's no, no getting, no accepted repetitive hits to the head till you're high school 14. You know, that makes sense, right? Like no kids want to get hit in the head that young anyway. We're just doing it because we think they need to get good at the sport for some reason when it doesn't matter. And then you pick up tackling and rugby and football and checking on ice hockey and heading and soccer then and then we really aggressively limit the exposure through like mon like telling people don't do more than x number of headers a week don't do more than this many minutes of live and, and we teach them how to conduct practice the right way until they're 18 when you're 18 then it's like you can get hit in the head as much as you want and then you just sort of the unions can can negotiate that mm -hmm. even though the college players are on an island right now with no one helping them but so it's it's not that hard to me that's the future it's it's eliminate the risk then minimize the risk and then when they're adults we'll see yeah you know? what do you think uh you know i think that's that's completely reasonable in terms of um preventive stuff protective stuff you know i think um as you said the culture really needs to change about this i th i think back on um you know, gladiators and things like that. You know, the society loves to see a good hit, uh, but can the game be played just as good without, you know, these massive hits, these, you know, cross the middle, hang up to dry hits, the Antonio Brown hits. Uh, I think it still can be a pretty enjoyable game to watch, but I think a culture change from the fans and where all the money comes from to watch these sports um, probably needs to happen. and in there would be some major benefits. I mean, what do you think about the NFL changes uh, that have occurred with the uh, kickoffs? And it, It's all great. It's just unfortunately a drop in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Is it going to actually change any outcomes for these players? Mm -hmm. Not really, right? Because you have to play 10, 15 years before you get to the NFL where those things were not in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. Um, what are the future directions you guys see in terms of the CTE research and potential treatments? What do you guys? Where do you guys see it in five years? Uh, well, uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, so, I mean, part of what we're, I keep trying to do is enable scientists to figure this stuff out, right? So, we have our brain bank in the U.S. We have brain banks in five other countries where we're trying to get people to, to donate, give them more evidence, and let them figure things out. We're recruiting uh, players to what we have a, a registry. If you're watching, you can sign up to get, take part in clinical studies. And we're recruiting three or four right now, uh, people trying to get biomarkers for CT so we can diagnose it. Once we can diagnose it with some confidence in living people, we finally are going to have clinical trials, interventions, and try to stop this stuff and try to understand where, you know, what you could treat it at different times. And, and then we have hope for, for those of us who might have this happening in our brains. Yeah. So for me, it's just like, so much of this is about getting, you know, finding scientists who are interested in this and helping them um, do real studies to, to keep plugging in the holes, so of which we've plugged in a ton over the last 10 years, but there's, there's a lot more work to do. Yeah, doing amazing work. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think um, it would just selfishly, based on my own research interests, be really interesting to take the location and um, abundance of CTE pathology and correlate that to uh, imaging that had been done when the person was alive and uh, clinical information that had been collected when the person was alive. I know that's rarer to come across, but I, I'm aware of some data sets that exist like that. If you could take some CTE pathology, some you know brain morphometric uh, data like the volume of the frontal lobe, for example, and correlate that to you know diffusion tensor imaging or other tractography type analyses of brain imaging that looks at white matter and say, you know what, there's more than meets the eye. The CTE lesion um, is just one part of this picture. When you take into account imaging, you know, you, you're getting other predictive power of symptoms and the clinical uh, diagnosis, let alone biomarkers are going to be the biggest thing, di you know, diagnosing this thing in life, maybe with tau pet or, or others is going to be I think crucial. blood work is going to be the future. What's that? I think blood. Yeah, you know, like the, are you you're using are you using blood tau measures for Alzheimer's? No, yeah, we we uh, no, not yet, but we are aware of it and probably bringing it into the fold soon. Yeah. Also, skin biopsy for alpha synucleinopathies. Oh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I think we you know we're going to borrow from all these other diseases right. that are ahead, 
and, and apply those. Yeah, and I, I saw um, a possible cross application of uh, some of the newer Alzheimer's drugs coming out with uh, reducing beta amyloid. You know, could that possibly have a place in CTE? No, no, probably not. Because really? there's very little beta amyloid issues with the CT patients. Some of them also develop Alzheimer's, right? But um, no. So you don't think that there could be any sort of cross application? I just think we haven't seen the. Oh, I do. I mean, on the tau stuff, absolutely. Right. Just, that, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, and amyloid. that's why the CT center BU is a, a part of the BU Alzheimer's disease centers. We're right. just trying to apply every Alzheimer's research strategy to it. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, it was an honor. Thank you so much for sitting down and, and talking CTE taking the time. Uh, it was a real honor to sit with you guys and, and discuss this stuff. Um, any last words from either of you promoting something or any closing remarks? I'll just say, look, you know, thanks for coming up to uh, make me part of this conversation. You guys do a great job. These are important conversations we need to have. And I guess if I was to say, you know, to, co to come away from this, I hope, again, that message is this is preventable and let's change what we do with young people. And then if you are worried about this, Remember that uh, there could be a lot of different things and everything you're dealing with is likely treatable and, and reach out to our helpline and we, if you're in LA, we'll send you to <laughs> Dr. Bickert yeah. and uh, we'll you know, we will help you live that life you wanna live. So there's absolutely hope, but they, we still need to work hard to prevent it and take care of people. Awesome, anything? The latter part of that message I echo completely. <laughs> I, you know, that's the number one thing I say at the end of every one of my talks on this and, and other areas with military, with, uh, you know, other patient populations, listen, you know, get to a specialist who's not going to say, hey, listen, you have CTE because you have psychiatric symptoms and you played football if, and you're doomed. The, the, the conversation ends there and the substance use gets worse, the psychiatric condition gets worse, they, you know, continue to have a, a tough time with family and so on. So get with somebody. There are very structured ways to go and rule out tons of other things and potentially treat things that are reversible. So uh, get to an expert and, um, and get educated. All right, everybody, if you're worried about CTE or if you've had concussions that you're concerned about, please contact the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Uh, and let's end CTE. Stay safe. Be well.